Okay, good morning. So let's continue. We're going to now start talking about denaturation, which you learned a little bit about in the virtual lab that you took about protein structure and function. So denaturation is an irreversible process by which a protein becomes unfolded. And once the protein unfolds, as I've mentioned in a previous lecture, because the folding process that leads to it acquiring its fully functional structure is a complex process in and of itself, if the protein unfolds and unravels and everything that was very carefully assembled becomes all mangled, pretty much, then the protein will no longer be functional. So what is occurring during denaturation is that all of the structural elements that maintain the protein's three-dimensional shape are ultimately tampered with and they are disrupted in such a way that the protein cannot, cannot come back and cannot do its function. So we're talking about quaternary, tertiary, and secondary structural elements. Denaturation does not involve the destruction of the primary sequence of the protein. That technically is still intact during the process of denaturation. It's simply that the original three-dimensional shape that the protein had acquired is no longer attainable because all of those components have been disrupted and therefore the functional characteristics disappear. So there are several ways in which proteins can be denatured chemical agents, physical processes, anything that interferes with interactions between structures and maintains that quaternary, tertiary, or secondary structural elements will cause denaturation. So in terms of chemical agents, we're talking about acids and bases, metal ions, anything that interferes that can trickle itself into the structure of the protein can lead to that. Soaps and detergents, any oxidizing and reducing agents. And then any physical action that will ultimately lead to the uh, physical destruction of the protein. So this, oh, this little cartoon over here is simply illustrating this process. So again, let's, let's assume that you have a protein that is fully functional, which what we call the native or active protein. If that protein is exposed to any of those agents, whether they're chemical or physical harm to the protein, the protein will become denatured. And at that point, by unraveling itself, as is sort of uh, very cartoonishly displayed here, the protein can no longer carry out its function that it's intended to. And this process of denaturation is actually an irreversible process. So as you know, you cannot uncook an egg. Once that egg is in the pot and the heat, in that case, it's the heat that's causing it. And those proteins become totally denatured, then you cannot bring the egg back to the way it was because it's done, right? So. The same thing happens with proteins in the human body. If for whatever reason you're exposed to chemical agents, things that are acidic or basic, let's say that change the pH of your bodily fluids within, these, within which these proteins are exposed to, then that causes them to lose their shape and they can no longer perform their job. If you're exposed to some kind of a toxin, for example, it can, it can be an organic compound that finds its way into the structure of proteins. It starts disrupting them, and that can cause disease and all kinds of damage. Um, heavy metal toxicity, for example, lead poisoning and other heavy metals that you've heard about, know that you're exposed to heavy metals and, you're, and, and they cause toxicity. One of the ways in which they can cause toxicity is by simply them finding a home within the structures of proteins. They interfere with the three-dimensional shape of how those proteins are supposed to be in order to be able to carry out their functions. And the moment those proteins acquire those metals that shouldn't be there, their structure is altered and therefore their function is altered. So it's all about maintaining protein structure because without protein structure, the function goes away and therefore they, that can have detrimental effects. So 
This is why when you're working in the laboratory, it's very important that you wear safety glasses because your cornea, cornea contains all kinds of proteins that make up the structure of the cornea. And if you get splashed with concentrated acid or concentrated base or some substance that can get into those proteins into the cornea, that can cause permanent and irreversible damage that can lead to blindness, okay? These substances that we are commonly used to using for uh, antiseptics and things of the sort, some of them function in this fashion. So things like rubbing alcohol, which is isopropanol, that substance acts as a disinfectant because it finds its way into the, pre the proteins that make up the cell membranes and the enzymes of microorganisms. And the moment those proteins become destroyed by the presence of this substance that got into their structure, then they no longer can function and that's what ultimately kills these microorganisms. Now there's an interesting application of this process that I believe you studied in the lab as well, which is the process of uh, changing the shape of your hair. So your hair, just like your uh, fingernails, your toenails, um, is largely composed of keratin. It's another fibrous protein uh, with similar functions and similar shape and uh, structure than, uh, to collagen. It's a very important structural protein. Um, so it turns out that that is a protein that can actually technically be denatured reversibly. It's one of few examples of proteins that can do that. And that's because it turns out that the strands of the protein are largely held together by disulfide bonds. And disulfide bonds can be reversibly reduced. And once they're reduced, they can be reoxidized back to the disulfide. So it turns out that if you have, let's say you have straight hair and you wanna make yourself look, uh, look pretty with curly hair. So then what you do is you take your hair that's straight you add a, a reducing agent that's gonna break all of these disulfide bonds, it's gonna suddenly expose the thiol functionalities and now the strands have been separated. So if you now curl your hair in the curling iron or, or rollers or whatever it is, right? Now, and then at that point, you add chemicals that will reestablish, reoxidize those thiols back to the disulfides well, now when you remove and wash all the chemicals, you've reestablished the structure of the protein, the disulfide bonds that held the strands together. But now that happened after it's been curled. You can actually do it in the opposite direction. If you have curly hair and, and you want to, you know, again, change your hair to make it straight, it's kind of the reverse process. So you start with your curly hair, right? And then you add the agent that's going to break those disulfide bonds and you expose the thiols, then you straighten the hair, and then you reoxidize back to the disulfides, and that reestablishes the connections, and now the hair has been straightened. So this is an example of very few, in fact, that are out there in which you can actually reversibly cause the protein to be uh, denatured and renatured. In this case, th these pieces that I'm highlighting here, which are actually the various strands of the protein, they do not become affected. If they were, in terms of their structure, then that's it. The hair will be gone, destroyed or whatever, right? But if you, if you very carefully chemically only alter these multitude of disulfide bonds and then you reshape the hair and you reform them because that particular step is reversible then this is an example of technically a reversible denaturation process but in general in general it's irreversible so this was a question that was meant to ask which protein uh which level of protein structure is not affected by these chemical or physical changes that can cause denaturation and of course it's primary sequence primary sequence now if you if you heat it long enough and you put it to very, very high pHs or you combine these two things, in fact, when you heat it and simultaneously bring a protein um, to very high or very low pH, at that point, the protein, even the primary sequence does not survive. The protein at that point is technically hydrolyzed. All of the individual amino acids will be exposed and the whole thing falls apart 
falls apart into its, into its constituent pieces. But generally speaking, just by heating, just by putting an acid, the only thing that will be affected is quaternary, tertiary, secondary structure. The primary structure remains intact. Only when you take it to the extreme, when you combine multiple ways of doing these things, you're really you know, hitting it really, really hard. That's when then you can manage to ultimately break down the primary sequence. All right. So we now are heading into the last portion of the course, uh, which is going to take us into the concept of enzymes. So it turns out that enzymes are largely proteins. There are a few examples in which they're actually not entirely composed of proteins. Unfortunately, we're not going to get to talk about those because this is what has to do with molecular genetics and um, other structures having to do with protein synthesis in which RNA is in fact involved in the process. But for the most part, um, the thousands of chemical transformations that are happening in the human body would not occur at an appreciable rate that would allow life to continue were it not for these, uh, there's, a, there's a large number of uh, proteins within the body which are called enzymes, which are nothing other than biological catalysts, okay? So as I've mentioned, most are globular proteins, as I, but as I also briefly mentioned, there are examples in very specific places for very specific reasons that RNA may be, or, or is, because it's well known that it is, uh, actually actively participating in the process of catalyzing chemical transformations. Now, enzymes, are categorized, named, referred to, described in various ways. They've been known for a very long time, and before there was any type of systematic approach to naming things, people would just assign whatever name they wanted to to something. If they discovered it, they put their name to it, or the name of a relative, or whatever. Sometimes they associated the transformation that the enzyme catalyzes with the name that was given to the enzyme. That's still reasonably common. But there are many names that are historical or trivial. Um, some have persisted, others have been phased out, and more systematic approaches to naming things have been introduced. So it turns out that, again, some of these historical naming schemes still exist and, and are, in fact, important because they're informative in terms of what the enzyme does, as I mentioned. So sometimes the enzyme is named based on the substrate or the class of substrate or the type of bond they target. And again, this is informative because you know that it's going to do this or that or the other thing on a particular type of compound or a particular type of structural feature. They can also be classified based on the type of reaction they catalyzed. And it's even more informative if you actually combine these two. So for example, there's an enzyme that's called aldehyde reductase, okay? And as the name implies, it's very easy to figure out that this enzyme will take an aldehyde and will reduce it to an alcohol, okay? Now there's, a, there's a, um, some entity out there, the International Union of Biochemistry and Enzyme Commission, something or other, I forget the, the full what this uh, acronym stands for exactly, but it's, a, it's, an, it's an entity, it's like, a, it's like an agency, if you, if you will, that sets the rules for naming enzymes, existing ones, and any newly enzymes that are newly discovered, they come up with is this numerical assigning system to give them some random combination. Well, that's not random, but the specific combination of numbers and letters and whatnot. Those of you who may be working in diagnostics, for example, in which enzymes are widely used in, in diagnostic uh, tests, um, you will learn about the, that whole naming numbering system. Because again, when you're ordering the chemicals and putting together the assay to establish this or that or the other thing, measuring in the laboratory, you will become familiar with the enzymes that are in there and what they do. And then they're all classified by these uh, numerical and letter combined uh, schemes. All right, however, here's the, here's the easy part or, or, or the, the part that makes it a little bit easier. And it's that it turns out that regardless of the reaction that is being catalyzed, the 
all the enzymes that exist can luckily for us be classified amongst a short list of categories which is narrowed down to six there's there's technically regardless of how many types of reactions there are out there you there are millions and millions of chemical transformations that happen in the human body that are catalyzed by enzymes but if you actually look and look at what's happening you can actually classify any type of enzymatic reaction into one of six categories and they're shown here so oxidoreductases are enzymes that will catalyze a redox transformation okay a transferase as the name implies will catalyze the transfer of one group from one functional group from one position to another position that's called a transferase so a functional group is moved if you will from one position of a structure to another place in another structure that's called a transferase okay all right, oops, sorry about that. A hydrolase, as the name implies, will uh, carry out a hydrolysis reaction. So it's the breaking of a bond by the actions or intervention of water, okay? Hydrolysis, remember that? We talked about that reaction before. Hydrolysis, right? Oops, lysis which most people refer to as hydrolysis, but if you actually analyze the word, it's hydrolysis, breaking by the act of water. So uh, some of these names, some of them have no rhyme or reason. Again, these, these are just sometimes historical things. So a lyase, a lyase, again, that name makes absolutely no sense with anything that you've ever heard before probably, is a enzyme that in the process, a structure, gains or loses a small molecule okay so we're going to see examples you have a structure that has an alcohol for example and it becomes dehydrated by losing water so that dehydration process water is lost and then because the water is lost a small molecule is given up the remaining structure has lost that little piece in the form of water that technically is a lyase some molecules will gain carbon dioxide as part of a transformation right so that also incorporates some kind of a structure something small gets incorporated into something larger that's catalyzed by lyase all right the name isomerase should tell you that it's the conversion between isomers so we're going to look at examples of transformations in which one isomer is converted to another Unfortunately, we're not going to get to the chapter on metabolism. Those of you who are going into human biochemistry or other upper division biochemistry courses, you will definitely see uh, many, many, many transformations involving uh, every reaction that helps us sustain our own life. And you will see many examples of isomerization. So this compound is isomerized to an isomer because that's what's necessary for things to happen. And <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> and then lastly, there's what's called a ligase. So a ligase is a enzyme that catalyzes the formation of a bond between two molecules. So we're going to look at examples of all of these so that you can start looking at uh, and start recognizing the examples. So again, oxidoreductases catalyze the uh, eight, eight, any kind of a redox transformation, typically in a reversible fashion. So the same enzyme that can catalyze a reduction will also be able to catalyze an oxidation depending on the needs of the cell. Okay, so we mentioned previously, and we're going to talk about this again, that these redox enzymes require what we call a coenzyme and we're going to expand on that because you don't the enzyme itself cannot be involved in the redox transformation it cannot be oxidized or reduced there needs there needs to be a prosthetic group something within the enzyme that is the the catcher or deliverer of the electrons in the process of the redox transformation and it, it, the integrity of the enzyme itself is maintained. So turns out 
that within the broader category of oxidoreductases, you can actually identify several different subcategories of enzymes that carry out specific transformations. Within the, the realm of redox, there's different possibilities of things. And if there's a specific redox transformation that happens and that enzyme can be named within a subcategory. So for example, here's a, an important uh, transformation that happens during metabolism, which is the conversion of lactate, i.e. lactic acid. Remember all carboxylic acids and bodily fluids exist in their carboxylate form. So lactate, which is the product of, um, or the end product of metabolism of glucose under uh, conditions of strenuous activity with limited availability of oxygen, what we call anaerobic glycolysis. That substance accumulates in muscle. That's what leads to muscle aches and pains and irritation and whatnot when you do a heavy duty workout. Well, that substance goes back to the liver and the liver reconverts lactate to pyruvate. And if you, if you observe the structure, this piece, the alcohol of the lactate, it's a secondary alcohol, becomes a ketone, okay? So notice a bond has been gained to oxygen. It was single and now it's double, plus these hydrogens have been lost. Where did the hydrogens go? One ends up on, on, on what was an AD+. These are the coenzymes that I'm talking about that we've learned about previously. So in this case, because the substrate, which is lactate, is becoming oxidized, something has to be reduced. It's not the enzyme, because that would cause the enzyme to become de technically denatured and non-functional. Something within the enzyme, which is this coenzyme, is what becomes reduced. That one picks up hydrogen, notice, if you compare, right? And that's and when, then the other, it turns out, is kicked off as a proton. So the, 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 the lactate loses two hydrogens, becomes oxidized to pyruvate. The NAD plus is reduced to NADH. And we call the enzyme a dehydrogenase because if you pay close attention, technically the components of H2 were lost from the lactate as it became pyruvate. So transferases can also be named as subcategories of enzymes. There's many different categories of transferase reactions. So for example, you learned in the laboratory about the liver transaminases. So these will catalyze the transfer. This is what a transferase does. In this case, as the name suggests, of an amino group. So during metabolism of proteins, I believe I mentioned uh, previously, that um, once your body takes in all the protein that it needs and it takes you know, all those amino acids and it sends them where they need to go, whenever you have an, all the excess of amino acids, we need to get rid of them. We need to remove their nitrogen because the body has no ability to store nitrogen. And these transaminase enzymes, their function is to remove the nitrogen from the excess amino acids that have been gained from the diet and excrete that nitrogen in the form of urea. So there's a particular vitamin, vitamin B6, for those of you are in the nutrition program. Vitamin B6 is the vitamin, is the redox coenzyme that's within these transaminases that is responsible for the redox transformation associated with removal of the nitrogen. If you're deficient in vitamin B6, then you have serious problems with nitrogen metabolism and you can have all kinds of issues with that. All right, kinases is another important class of enzymes. They transfer phosphate, phosphate, from point A to point B, from one molecule to another, okay? There's a difference with another type of enzyme that also transfers phosphate. This one is called a phosphorylase. A phosphorylase is gonna transfer a phosphate, not from one molecule to another, but from inorganic phosphate that's floating around in solution, and it puts it on a larger organic structure, which can be another enzyme, it can be anything, right? But the difference between a kinase and a phosphorylase, the kinase picks up the phosphate from compound A, and it puts it on compound B. The phosphorylase 
All right, I'm back. I think I'm back. Okay. So, um, just to clarify, finish up this, this thing that I was saying. Kinase takes a phosphate from structure A and puts it on structure B. Phosphorylase looks for phosphate in the surrounding aqueous solution, picks it up, and then puts it somewhere else on some other structure. Okay? All right. And then here's another one example, transmethylase. You can see by the, the name is very suggestive. What do you think transmethylate does? It transfers a methyl group from point A to point B, kind of like a kinase, but instead of phosphate, it's a methyl, right? So for example, in the biosynthesis of epinephrine, also known as adrenaline, norepinephrine, which, which is this structure, needs to have a methyl group attached on that terminal nitrogen. Well, there's an enzyme whose abbreviation is shown here, something or other methyl transferase, PMNT or PNMT. It transfers that methyl group and puts it on that nitrogen. So these are just, this one in particular is a very specific example. Kinases and phosphorylases are quite common. There are many, 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 many transformations that involve phosphate being moved from here to there. Turns out phosphate is an important tag that are, is put on structures to then alert other entities that are surrounding that something needs to happen with that structure or either it gets turned on or gets turned off or gets uh, uh, destroyed or gets activated or whatever. All kinds of different things happen by phosphate transfer. As I mentioned, hydrolases involve cleavage of things by the actions of water, okay? So a phosphatase, not to be confused with a phosphorylase, not to be confused with a kinase, a phosphatase removes phosphate. Where it ends up doesn't matter. It takes it off and off it goes. No more phosphate. That's what a phosphatase does. A peptidase, as the name implies, is technically an amidase because it breaks down amide bonds, specifically peptide bonds that are joining amino acids together in the structure of a protein. So when you take in your cheeseburger, your steak, your fish, your soybeans, whatever source of protein you ingest, all of these enzymes that are in your intestines chopping things up, the peptidases are the ones that are going after all the proteins and they're chopping them up into little pieces and breaking down all those peptide bonds so that you can ultimately absorb all of those amino acids. Lipases, as the word implies, these will cleave ester bonds in lipids. So unfortunately, we didn't get to the chapter in lipids. This is the general structure of what we call a triglyceride. A triglyceride is the fancy name for fat or oil. Okay, depending on the structure of these pieces, they're very, very long. Depending on if they have amino uh, uh, double bonds or not, that makes the structure saturated versus unsaturated, and that affects their behavior and all kinds of different things. So it turns out when you intake olive oil, you know, avocado oil or butter or lard or whatever you like to eat that has fat, this is technically the type of structure that you are ingesting. Okay, so the body needs to break that down because this is too big for it to be absorbed as it is. So ultimately, these lipases will come along and they will chop off these ester linkages, okay? And then that releases glycerol, and when you break down an ester, the other component that's not the alcohol is the carboxylic acid. So the triglycerides get digested, technically, I mean literally, it's an esterase because it's breaking down these ester bonds and it's the, when, you know, lipases specifically are, tr are targeting these lipids, these specific types of lipids, which are called triglycerides. So when you get your blood drawn amongst the things that they measure when they get a lipid profile, one of the things they measure is your triglycerides, which is literally measuring how much fat and oil is in your blood. Okay. All right. 
So I mentioned IAs as the gain or loss of a small molecule. So for example, there are specific lyases, there's what we call a dehydratase. Remember how I mentioned water can be gained or lost in a particular transformation? Those are called dehydratases. There are decarboxylases. These are enzymes that will catalyze the loss or addition of a carbon dioxide. Remember how I mentioned mon these reactions are typically reversible? So the D suggests that they're taking things off. That's how the enzymes were technically discovered, by them removing water, removing CO2. But then it turns out that if you look closely, depending on the needs of the cell, the same enzyme that took off the water or the CO2 can also actually put it back on, right? So the names have persisted in many cases, but these enzymes, many of these enzymes can go in either direction, depending on the reaction, depending on the needs of the cell at that moment. So here's an example of actually a dehydratase actually putting on a water molecule. So fumarate becomes malate as part of the citric acid or Krebs cycle. And then this alkene over here, water is incorporated into that structure. Remember, water can be drawn as OHH, right? So this is one component, this is the other component. Notice how the two components have now been added. It's an addition process, if you will, um, that it becomes incorporated into the other structure. So the, the enzymes that do these types of things are called lyases. They take something small and they somehow piece it in pieces. It's not that the whole thing just latches on. Typically it's in pieces, right? The, the small piece gets attached to the larger entity and the enzyme catalyzes that process. And then I mentioned the isomerases. These are the enzymes that will catalyze the interconversion of isomers. So here's an example of a transformation that happens during glycolysis. So when you ingest carbohydrates in the diet, all of those, you know, amylase, lipase, uh, amylate, um, amylose, I'm talking about the enzymes, amylose, amylopectin, the starches. In fact, when you eat meat products, there's glycogen in muscle, and you also ingest that. So all of those complex carbohydrates get chopped down to ultimately glucose. The glucose is absorbed, and then the glucose is broken down into little pieces to extract the energy that it provides, right? And this is true for most cells in the body. So among, along the way, there's a transformation in which this compound, 3-phosphoglycerate, needs to be transformed into 2-phosphoglycerate. So what happened here? The phosphate moved from this position, which is 1, 2, 3, to this position, which is one, two, two, right? One, two, three, but it's on two now, right? So these enzymes are referred to as mutases because technically the structure has been uh, mutated into something else. There are epimerases, not this one, but there are epimerases that will convert, for example, galactose into glucose, right? They're epimers. There are examples of things of, of the source. So there's all kinds. These are just two of many examples of isomerases. One compound transforms into another. And if you look closely, they're actually isomers. Okay. And then the last category are the ligases. Ligases are the ones that are involved in bonding two structures together, larger structures typically, right? So the, the, the scenario where ligases are most common is um, in molecular genetics. So as your RNA and DNA are being produced, uh, altered, synthesized, reproduced, whatever, ha whatever is happening with them, um, typically pieces of DNA and or RNA need to be put together, right? And you have a, a piece of DNA that has some alcohol at the end and you have another piece of DNA that has a phosphate at the end, and these two have to be brought together to form what we call a phosphodiester bond. And that now joins this large piece of DNA with the other piece of DNA, and they're both enormous. But then this little tip on each one, they need to come together. And what does that is the ligase, DNA ligase, and there's an RNA ligase, and there's all kinds of different ligases that are involved in this process. All right, so you need to be able to look at a transformation and identify 
what's happening, what type of enzyme would be involved. And we're not going to ask you the, the subcategories like the mutase and the epimerase and the, you know, this kind of, for, for, for some of them anyway. When it's uh, some, of, some of them that I did spend a little time, like the kinase and the phosphatase and the phosphorylase, those you do have to be able to identify because they're different. But, you know, in other cases, and I'll mention the ones that you have to know more specifically. Um, in most cases, you just have to sort of know the big picture, right? So here's an example of a reaction. What happens here? And then, let me zoom in here so that you can, uh, can be seen a little bit better. All right. So if you notice, this is glucose. And you have an enzyme that's called aldehyde reductase. And if you observe, this piece has become this, right? So an aldehyde becoming a primary alcohol is automatically a reduction process. Well, the name of the enzyme tells you that, right? The aldehyde of the glucose becomes primary alcohol. This is how sorbitol is generated in, in living systems. This kind of should be done in the laboratory, as we discussed. Now, anytime you see one of these redox coenzymes, here's another one that changes in its hydrogen content. And as one becomes reduced, the other one becomes oxidized. Then you already know this is a redox transformation. So this is an oxidoreductase is the enzyme that is involved in this process. Okay. So this one is actually a little, a little cousin of the one we saw before. We'd, we'd seen the NADH becoming NAD plus and vice versa. I'm going to do a little reversible arrows here. It can go in either direction depending. Well, this one has a P in it, right? So what does that mean? It turns out that that one is a pho has a phosphate attached to the structure. As I mentioned, phosphates are very important in all sorts of places in biochemistry. And when a structure gains or loses a phosphate, that changes everything. So in this case, it turns out that these redox coenzymes that have a phosphate have a slightly different role in the types of reactions that they specifically are involved in relative to the ones that do not have the phosphate. Okay, this is just an example of that. All right, so here's another one. This is maltose. Notice the name of the enzyme, maltase, right? So when an enzyme has sort of partially includes the name of something and then ends in ace, that typically is the sign that it's a hydrolase. It breaks things down into pieces by the actions of water. So what you can see here is that what is a disaccharide, the acetal, which is what holds it together, that's the glycosidic bond, water is incorporated into this, and these are split apart into two pieces. So notice you get two glucose structures. This is a hydrolase, okay? Specifically, you could call it a glycosidase, right? Glycosidase. Glycosidase means that it specifically hydrolyzes a glycosidic bond. And then you can go even further, and this one is specifically maltase because it is hydrolyzing maltose, which is that compound, that specific compound that's there. Is maltase the only one that can hydrolyze maltose? Probably not. There could probably be other glycosidases that can do it. It would have to be a alpha, like alpha 1,4 glycosidase, and there's many examples of those enzymes. But notice how, again, you can tweak the name to go from the very broad hydrolase to more specific glycosidase to very specific maltase, which is the maltose enzyme. Okay? All right. Here's um, another example. So if you observe this piece here and you compare that to this piece here, okay, notice there's been a loss, loss of hydrogen the equivalent of losing H2. The enzyme is called stereo-CoA desaturase. So that stereo-CoA has become oleo-CoA, which is unsaturated. It lost hydrogen. So this is an oxidoreductase, and this is actually an oxidation reaction, as shown here, okay? Anytime you lose hydrogen, loss of hydrogen, this is an oxidation process.
So you need to recognize that it's a loss of hydrogen, which is an oxidation process, and therefore the enzyme is an oxidoreductase. Okay? Oxidoreductase is the one that's carrying out this specific transformation that's shown here. All right, so this was a clicker question that we would have asked in class. Again, what class of enzyme catalyzes this reaction? You just need to stand back and observe what's happening. So the moment you see these NADH, NAD, NAD+, NADP+, all these things, it's an automatic redox transformation. So this has to be an oxidoreductase. But if you look at the substrate, which is the substance that's undergoing the transformation, again, you'll notice that this alcohol becomes a ketone. So you gained bonds to oxygen and you lost hydrogen. Loss of hydrogen is in and of itself oxidation. Gain of bonds to oxygen in, is in and of itself oxidation. So this is technically oxidation happening in both directions, right? Loss of hydrogen and gain of bonds to oxygen. But the enzyme is, of course, an oxidoreductase because this is a redox transformation. Nothing's being transferred. Nothing's being hydrolyzed. These two are not isomers because they have a different composition. The one has two more hydrogens than the other, right? Or the product has two less hydrogens than the starting material. They're not isomers. So this is not an isomerase. This is an oxidoreductase. All right. So when you're looking and studying enzymes, what's unique and important about enzymes is their specificity. And that specificity can actually vary depending on the enzyme or the class of enzymes. So some enzymes have what we call absolute specificity. And what that means is that it only recognizes a single substrate and nothing else and it will only act when it finds that one substrate and it only produces one product, and that's all, right? So for example, there's an enzyme called urease, and this enzyme, the only thing that it does is that it takes urea, and only urea, and it will hydrolyze it into ammonia and CO2 and whatever, right? The structure of urea contains a carbonyl simultaneously bonded to two nitrogen. It's like a double amide, if you will. And urea is the end product of amino acid metabolism. All that nitrogen that I've been talking about, that the transaminases need to get involved to get rid of and remove it and whatnot from amino acids, all of that nitrogen ultimately ends up on this structure of urea. And then it goes into the urine. That's why urea is related to urine because the names are historically related. Urea goes into the urine. That's where the nitrogen ultimately ends up. So this enzyme urease, its only substrate is urea, nothing else. All right. There are certain enzymes that are a little bit less specific. They will recognize a particular type of functional group or bond. We call that relative specificity. So it doesn't matter the structural context it can recognize a whole multitude of different structures as long as those structures all contain a particular functional group or a particular type of bond, that enzyme is able to target those substrates and transform them. So for example, alcohol dehydrogenase, when you ingest alcohols, the common one that everybody who drinks alcohol ingests is ethanol, but any other type of alcohol that you may be exposed to, you may ingest, or you may acquire from the diet and whatever reason, this enzyme specifically is looking for the alcohol functionality. And it will transform that alcohol into aldehydes and or carboxylic acids depending on the substrate. <clears throat> As I mentioned, lipase is an esterase that will hydrolyze triglycerides. Well, I mentioned in that brief discussion that the three little pieces of the triglyceride can be different. But it's not looking for that. It's looking for the ester, for that tri, the three esters that are bonded on that structure. That's what it's looking for. So it's hydrolyzing those esters. Does it matter what else is on the structure? So it's specific for esters. And then there's what's called stereochemical specificity, in which enzymes are looking for specific specific 
three-dimensional shapes or three-dimensional arrangements in a wide variety of different structures. So for example, it can be looking for a cis or a trans arrangement of groups around an alkene or around a ring structure. It can be looking in the case of, of enzymes that are, are involved in uh, carbohydrate metabolism. It can be looking specifically for D sugars versus L sugars. Okay, so it really, it varies. All right, so now we need to talk a little bit about what enzymes actually are doing, which is catalyzing transformations and affecting the rate at which those reactions ultimately take place. So depending on how the substrate concentration affects the rate of reaction, we can classify reactions involving enzymes in different ways. So you learned a little bit about this in the lab as well. Whenever the rate of an enzyme catalyzed reaction is in fact independent, independent of the concentration of any reactant or product, then we call that a zero order reaction, meaning the rate is constant. Only the amount of enzyme, obviously, because you don't have the enzyme, then there's nothing, right? But only the amount of enzyme determines how fast the reaction goes. However, there are other transformations in which not only is the amount of enzyme important, but the amount of the actual substrate at which the enzyme carries out the transformation is also important. So whenever the rate of the reaction is directly dependent in direct proportion to how much substrate is present, then that is known as a first order reaction, okay? So it makes sense that the, as long as there's enough enzyme, the more you have of the substance, the faster the reaction is gonna go because you have more of whatever it is that's being transformed to carry out the transformation, okay? But there are examples of transformations that in fact, it's not dependent on substrate. The only limiting factor at that point would be the enzyme concentration. So the first order transformations are quite common, typically when you have a single substance that's being broken down into pieces, which is not uncommon in metabolism. And then there's the next layer, which is when sometimes either two substances are reacting substance A and substance B, or when two molecules of a single substance, substance A, are reacting with each other to then produce a product. In, in, in either of those two cases, it turns out the rate of the reaction will be directly proportional to the square of the concentration of that single reactant, if, which is the most common situation. To, uh, two of the same rate making something else. Whenever you have a proportionality that's associated with the square of concentrations, whether it's the same substance or the product of two things, that's known as a second order reaction, okay? Typically what that means is that at the, at the step on the transformation that determines the overall rate, you have two entities coming together, which is whether it's two of the same or two different things. One measure that is very common to establish how fast or how slow a enzyme catalyzed reaction proceeds is by measuring what is known as the half-life. The half-life is the time that is required for 50% of the initial concentration of the reactant to have been consumed, okay? So how, much, how long does it take for half of the material you started with to be gone? That's the half-life. Turns out it depends on the order, different orders of reactions, whether it's independent of substrate, directly proportional to substrate, or proportional to square of substrate, that affects the half-life. And it also depends on the actual transformation itself. Different enzymes, different substrates have different half-lives, but it's a measure of how fast the reaction goes. A 
a reaction that has a very short half-life is a very fast process because you lose your substrate very quickly, right? 50% is gone in a very short amount of time. If it's a long half-life, then it's a, it's a re reasonably slow reaction, relatively speaking, in the enzyme world, right? So it takes a long time. So that's a long half-life for 50% of your starting material to disappear. But it truly depends on the reaction. So when you're looking at an enzyme catalyzed reaction and you compare it to the non-enzyme catalyzed reaction, what is important is to notice that what is truly affected is the total or net activation energy, which is that energy that is needed to ultimately um, carry out the transformation, right? The energy that needs to be exchanged between reactants in order to get things going. So if you lower that, then the reaction is much faster. So that's what the enzyme is actually doing. The enzyme is actually changing the activation energy. So on the right, if these are your reactants and these are your products, and let's say it goes through this pathway that has this activation energy that's you know relative to the other one is taller, the enzyme comes along, takes the reactants, takes it in a little bit of a different pathway, Notice that there's an additional step that's been added here. There's two steps in this transformation. Additional steps have been added there, and that's fine. But the tallest peak, the tallest peak in the enzyme catalyzed reaction is shorter than the highest peak, in this case, only one, in the uncatalyzed reaction. As long as the tallest peak along the pathway, the one that requires the most energy, along the pathway of the catalyzed transformation is smaller, then the reaction will be faster no matter how many steps are added to the, uh, to the transformation by the enzyme. The critical observation that you need to note is that the relative positions of reactants and products, if you draw two lines here, this relative distance is unchanged by the enzyme. The enzyme only affects the top part of the structure. That's where the kinetics, right? Kinetics are existing. Down here is the thermodynamics, right? Which is the relative stability of the reactants and the products. That is not affected by the enzyme because that's an inherent part of the integrity of the substance, right? The enzyme doesn't touch that. It only affects how fast the reactants become product, which is on the top of the, of the, um, of the graph. All right, so a couple of additional things related to enzymes. So enzymes can be either homogeneous or heterogeneous. And what that means is that if an enzyme is homogeneous, it and its substrate exist in the same phase. So they're either both soluble in the aqueous phase, whether they're inside or outside of the cell or inside a, a organelle or outside the organelle. They're all in the same phase. They can also both be embedded within a membrane, okay? And in that case, the enzyme and the substrate are both sort of embedded within that hydrophobic portion that makes up cell membranes. But as long as they coexist within the same medium, they're said to be homogeneous, the enzyme. Heterogeneous enzymes, on the other hand, will exist in a different phase as their substrate. So it's not uncommon for an, an, uh, an enzyme to be membrane bound, embedded within the membrane, but it actually ends up interacting with a substrate that's in the inside or the outside of that membrane. Somehow the substrate approaches the membrane and it's taken up by the enzyme and everything happens within the membrane, within the enzyme that's embedded within the membrane. You can also have soluble enzymes. They're floating around in the water phase inside or outside the cell. And they will be able to interact with a membrane bound substrate. So the enzyme approaches the membrane pick something up from the membrane, and then that's the target that it ultimately will act upon, okay? All right, so it turns out that enzymes, as we've been saying, are 
proteins, which generally are enormously large structures. But most of the substrates or many of the substrates that enzymes act upon are actually very small entities. Okay, so when you compare, for example, something like glucose or a triglyceride or an amino acid compared to the size of a protein, they are specks of dust compared to the size of these proteins that can have hundreds or even thousands of amino acids. So it turns out that only a very small portion of enzymes of their structure are actually responsible for carrying out these transformations, catalyzed transformations. And these structural components of the enzyme where this happens is what is known as the active site, okay? It's typically a little cleft or pocket somewhere on the enzyme surface where the substances simply find their way into that little pocket. And then once they're in there, they're like in a little cave. And then there's side chains of amino acids sticking up and down and left and right from all sorts of directions. If water is involved, then the water molecule finds a way to be, get in there as well. If there's a redox coenzyme, then of course that redox coenzyme will be an integral part of the protein itself, but it will be exposed within that active site. So all of the necessary components will be there, ready for the reaction to take place. And it's the orchestration, if you will, of all of those pieces coming together in the right orientation in the right positions relative to each other, all in the right amounts, all of that comes together. And that's what makes the reaction much faster. It's a highly orchestrated process as opposed to something randomly happening in solution, okay? All right, so once the substrate binds to the enzyme in the active site, that can happen either covalently or non-covalently. More common is non-covalent, in some cases it's covalent. What that then results in what we call the enzyme substrate complex. Okay, as I said, non covalent is more common, covalent is less common. So, what that does is that it actually increases the Gibbs free energy of the substrate, meaning it destabilizes the substrate and therefore makes it more reactive. The moment something becomes more reactive, then as we've said, it facilitates it being transformed into something else. So what the enzyme and its active site is actually doing is providing an environment that will facilitate the transformation of that substrate into the corresponding products. So over the many centuries or several centuries, many decades, let's put it this way, the several centuries, it's actually been several centuries where enzymes have been studied there are several models that have been proposed that sort of help explain how is it in fact that enzymes are able to carry out these transformations. So one model is what is known as the lock and key model. And in this model, what is described is that the enzyme and the substrate are both somewhat rigid and fit into each other perfectly like a key in a lock. So this is true or mostly true for what we refer to as absolute specificity. When the enzyme recognizes and acts upon one and only one substrate, this is the type of interaction that is believed to be happening because it only allows for one thing to fit. So like a key in a door, although you can put technically more than one key in a door, it's just not going to open, right? If you've tried that before. But technically, only one key will fit into the lock, and that's the only one. So this is, this is a limited model that would only be able to explain the substrates that have absolute specificity. The model that's most commonly accepted for enzyme action is what is known as the induced fit model. And this is one in which the active site is somewhat flexible, doesn't have a fixed three-dimensional shape, 
as the substrate, which will have or may have a somewhat rigid shape, but in some cases the substrates can also be somewhat flexible. As the substrate is approaching the active site, they both will conform themselves to each other and will ultimately allow them to fit. But that fit is induced. So it's like, it's as if you're putting your hand into a glove unless the glove is made of wood or metal that's not moving, you know, you put your hand into a glove, you can wiggle your fingers and the glove, you can kind of wiggle it, on the, you know, as you're putting it on and ultimately you can make it fit, right? So it's that type of thing. If your hand is the substrate and the glove is the active site, as I said, unless that thing is made of wood or metal, it has to go in a very specific orientation. No, if it's sort of malleable, then they can sort of, find a way to make it work, and then that works. So this is most commonly the case for all those other enzymes that we mentioned that can recognize a multitude of different substrates. They just happen to have the same or similar function, uh, functional group. This is the, most, the, the, the model that makes most logical, that makes most sense, the most logical sense uh, for, the, for these enzymes to follow. So it, most enzymes are believed to follow this mode of action because otherwise, they're severely restricted into what they can do. All right, so in terms of the describing the process, again, you learned a little bit about this in the lab. If we consider the enzyme, the enzyme initially has nothing in its active site. The substrate will either perfectly fit or be made to fit into the uh, active site that produces this initial enzyme substrate complex. The process is completely reversible. You know, it can go in, it can go out, it can go in, it can go out. But once it's in there, it will progressively be transformed into product. And then at that point, once the product is formed, the product is released and the enzyme can come back and the process can start again. So what is it that's happening in the active site? So it turns out, as I mentioned moments ago, there are a whole bunch of amino acid side chains that are oriented in particular directions in three-dimensional space towards the, within the active site, ultimately will be pointing towards the substrate. And it's these side chains, combination of them, that will interact with the substrate and then cause it to be transformed, okay? So there can be, as I mentioned, organic molecules like the redox coenzymes, NADH, NADPH, NAD+, whatever it is, they can also be contained and bound to the active site, also making contact in a very orchestrated fashion with the substrate. Remember how I keep talking about metal ions? The, the structural integrity and, in fact, the functionality of many enzymes depend on metal ions because metal ions themselves can serve as redox cofactors. Not only is these organic molecules, but metal ions can lose or gain electrons in the process of a redox transformation within an enzyme. They are the ones that are actively needed in that active site. If you don't have that metal, that enzyme doesn't work, okay? So these are very important in many cases. And then in the case of the hydrolases, but that's not the only one, um, external molecules, so in the case of the hydrolases, it's water, but it can be a variety of different things. You may need some external molecule that also needs to be present and oriented in a particular three-dimensional direction and orientation within that active site in order for things to be able to happen properly to the substrate. Okay, so once the product is formed, as I mentioned, it will also reversibly be released from the active site, and that's what regenerates the enzyme, and the enzyme can go back and the process starts again. As I also mentioned, enzymes can go in the opposite direction, so the product, the product can become the substrate if it's very, very abundant and there's not much of this one. That can jump into the enzyme and then things can go backwards okay and pretty much the same process but it's going in the opposite direction so typically when the substrate is in excess the reaction moves to the right 
when the product is in excess and the um, substrate is in deficit, then the reaction can proceed to the left. And this is very, very common with, very, with many, many reactions. Depending on what the needs of the cell are, um, it can go one way or the other depending on what's available. Okay? All right. So this is what I've been mentioning. Now I'm going, we're going to formalize the discussion. And it's that many enzymes depend on the actions of these prosthetic groups that we, as a, in, in the big sense, in the, in the grand scheme of things, we call them cofactors. Okay? Now, when those cofactors are specifically in organic structure, they're called coenzymes. So all coenzymes are cofactors, but not all cofactors are coenzymes. Coenzyme is if it's an organic structure. So when we're talking about metal ions, as I've been mentioning, these, are, these can only be called uh, cofactors. Once we start talking about NAD, NADH, FAD, FADH2, coenzyme A, that one actually has the name embedded into that whole thing. These um, are organic structures. And it turns out all or most, I believe all, but there could be an exception because nothing's absolute in life, as you all know. Um, let's say the vast majority, if not all, coenzymes come from vitamins. So the reason why you need vitamins in your diet is because they are providing the skeletons of the coenzymes that end up in all of the enzymes that exist within your body. And if you're not taking those, those vitamins, then you don't have those coenzymes and then your enzymes cannot do their job. So niacin, riboflavin, pantothenic acid, um, that's a very short list. These are all enzymes that will ultimately provide these structures shown here on the left that will become the functional enzyme. All right, so when the enzyme has been fully formed but has not acquired its cofactor, that is referred to as the apoenzyme. Apoenzymes are non-functional. They, they don't have the, that one piece that they need to be able to complete their structure, that, their functional structure, let's put it that way. Once the fully functional enzyme has acquired its cofactor, then we call that the holoenzyme. So holoenzymes are the fully functional piece of structures. Apoenzymes are missing that one piece that they need. So because enzymes are proteins, which is what we started this discussion with, which is denaturation, anything and everything that affects protein structure and function will directly have an effect on enzyme structure and function. So this is why high fever is dangerous because you can denature the enzymes within your body. And if all the enzymes in your body start failing, then guess what? <coughs> That's the end, right? Taking a sip of a tea here. pH for the same reason, protons can attach and detach to proteins when there's too much or too little. That changes the overall charge on the structure. Charge is enormous in terms of maintaining structure. If structure falls apart, the enzyme falls apart, nothing can happen. Okay? Soaps and detergents for the same reasons. They can find, they can trickle themselves into the structure of a protein, including enzymes. They destroy them. Same thing with metal ions. And here we're not talking about the metal ions that are necessary. It's when you have other metal ions or even the one that's necessary, if there's too much of it, Right? As with everything, too much of a good thing is a bad thing. If you have an overdose of a, of a trace metal, you've been exposed and you don't know it, and you're taking too much, copper is an example, iron is an example, these things that start accumulating in all sorts of places, and then they can cause harm as opposed to causing the good pieces of what they're there for. And then as with everything, of course, this, this is, would be more in a laboratory setting, but it turns out you know, uh, stab wounds, gunshot wounds, motor vehicle accidents, anything that causes trauma um, can lead to uh, destruction of and denaturation of proteins. So as with all proteins, the functionality depends on these things. You can actually measure in a laboratory, and this translates to what happens in the human body, you can measure the optimal pH and the optimal temperature for proteins, i.e. enzymes in this case, to be able to be fully functional. And it turns out, as 
uh, should be most enzymes, their optimal pH is close to neutrality because remember our bodily fluid pH is in slightly basic, but it's in the 7.3 to 7.4 range. There are particular enzymes in specific places that will operate at different pHs than normal physiological pH because the environment in which they act upon requires it. So in the stomach, where your pH is really low, there are a whole bunch of stomach enzymes, pepsin and uh, amongst others, they actually operate maximally at low pH because that's how what it needs to be. If you look at the intestinal enzymes, where pH is slightly basic in the eight to nine range, trypsin, chymotrypsin, and a whole bunch of others, they will operate at their maximum rate at actually at those particular pHs. But if you look at any, any enzyme that may be inside a cell, inside the blood, anywhere else, where pH is 7.3 to 7.4, you're going to find that that's the maximum activity of the enzyme is observed. And then temperature is the same thing. And this is across the board. Body temperature is in the 38 to 40 range. Turns out that the um, maximum ability of enzymes to act and perform their tasks in the human body is, in fact, at bodily temperature, right? The moment the temperature starts going up, the activity starts going down. So when you have a fever, right, when you have a fever, then your enzyme activity can be compromised and that can lead to all sorts of problems. And the same thing happens with hypothermia. If you fall in a lake in the middle of the winter, um, then you have problems for the same reason. In that case, because the rate goes down because the enzymes are no longer operational, okay? So when you have acidemia, alkalemia, you know, too much or too little acid in your blood, it's affecting the structures and the charges on your enzymes. All of those enzymes are unable to do their job, okay? So this is what I've been saying, right? It influences the charges on the amino acids on the surface. And in fact, within the protein itself, the protons can find their way in to the structure of the protein and they can cause changes in the shape. And as I said with the temperature, right? Uh, proteins be begin to denature beyond a uh, particular temperature. And this is what I've been saying about high fever it can cause denaturation of enzymes and that can lead to death if the temperature goes up too much. Okay. All right. So um, we have about two minutes. So I think I'm going to stop here today because this is a very long and complicated discussion. This is going to be the last lecture. Um, I believe I'm going to have time to finish the whole thing, but we'll see. Um, so I think that's going to be it for today. We'll continue with the last portion of uh, enzyme kinetics on uh, Thursday. Everybody have a wonderful afternoon.